for the interactive Q&A, and that will just be the LSE community. And right now we're just waiting to go live. So welcome everybody to this um, cutting edge issues uh, series. Um, and uh, this evening, we are extremely happy to have Jimmy Adesina with us. You know, Jimmy is a professor of sociology and holds the South African Research Chair in Social Policy at the College of Graduate Studies at the University of South Africa. He's, um, in, 19, in 2005, he was elected to the Academy of Science of South Africa. Uh, and before he went to UNISA, he was professor of sociology at Rhodes University and the University of the Western Cape. From 2002 to 2008, he served on the executive committee of the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, or CODESRIA. Um, and from 2004 to 2006, he was president of the South African Sociological Association. And I'm sure he has many other fine titles, uh, which I won't run through now. His, his work on social policy is extremely exciting and extremely important. There's a list and a raft of articles that um, I, I would recommend all of you to read, but I did wanna mention one that has just come out this year uh, that I looked at. Um, and um, it, it is a, a very imp important piece, um, uh, which my printout, <laughs> I just lost the proper uh, address, um, title. It's called Policy Mer Merchandising and Social Assistance in Africa. Don't call dog monkey for me. This was published in Development and Change earlier this year. And I, and I raise it because not only is it an extremely um, important treatment of uh, social assistance programs in Africa. It's a huge contribution to what we started off in this series and we will continue dealing with in relationship to decol decolonizing the field of development. I think it's an exemplary um, uh, illustration of what we need to do. Um, Jimmy, like me, shares an admiration for our late colleague, Tandika Makandawiri, and this lecture is being given in Tandika's honor. So I, I'm really delighted that Jimmy could join us from Pretoria uh, for, for the talk tonight. And just before I turn over the, the, the floor, as it were, to him, the podium, <laughs> the visual space, um, yeah. I want to introduce Dr. Kate Mahar, who is not a stranger to anyone at the International Development Department, um, where she teaches and research, researches on informal economy, um, is a member of the collective of the Development and Change Journal, um, and is you know, a, a really important scholar in her own right, um, uh, working in Nigeria and beyond. So Kate, we're really happy to have you here as discussant on Jimmy's talk. So without further ado, let me turn the floor, the screen, over to Jimmy. Thank you very much, uh, James. Uh, I hope the screen is uh, is is uh, okay. Perfect. Okay. So let me start by expressing my appreciation to uh, James and uh, and Duncan and the Department of International Development here at the LSE for the honor of this invitation. Um, the department is, is home to several friends. Uh, and it was the academic, uh, uh, it, it was, uh, it, you know, it, it, it was the academic home of a person to whom I owe a lot. Um, 
That's Professor Tandika Mkandawire. Uh, Tandika will have been 80 years old on 10th uh, October uh, this year. Uh, he passed away on the 27th of uh, March uh, this year. Uh, three people have been most influential in my academic journey. Uh, Omafumi Onoge and John Oherenua were influential teachers and Dugu during my time as a student at the University of Badon. And then there was Tandika, whom I met shortly after my completing my doctoral studies. And of him, I would say he to me was everything. Tandika was a veritable mwalimu. Every encounter, every moment of breaking bread was a time to behold the musing of a mind with immense capacity for observation and cutting through intellectual bull. From Tandika, one learned never to shirk from the coast of Africa. From him, we learn how to be human. And I present this lecture in his honor. The lecture is concerned with some of the lessons that we can learn from Africa's experience of the COVID-19 pandemic. A public lecture imposes time constraint. For this reason, I have limited my focus to two sets of lessons. Those concerned with the national responses to the livelihood impacts of the pandemic and what the pandemic re re reveals about the crisis of structural transformation research and innovation ecosystem and manufacturing capacity in Africa. I use these lessons to address why development and transformative social policy matter for Africa. The constraint of time also imposes a limit on country, on the country cases that can be used. In large part, though not exclusively, I've drawn on cases of Nigeria and South Africa. The choice is not accidental. These are the two largest economies in Africa, but the choice is also personal. I'm Nigerian by birth and South African by domicile. According to the African Center for Disease Control and Prevention, as of 14th November, 2020, there were 1,965,485 reported cases of SARS-CoV-2 infection across the continent and 47,134 confirmed COVID deaths. Africa accounts for 3.65% of the global reported cases of SARS-CoV-2 infection and 3.6% of reported COVID death. The Southern African region accounted for 42%, 42.75% of the total reported cases. North Africa accounted for 32.32%, West Africa for 10.06%. And South Africa accounted for 89.15% of the total reported cases in Southern Africa, while Morocco and Egypt accounted for 62.76% of the total confirmed cases in North Africa. In West Africa, Nigeria accounted for 32.85% of the total confirmed cases. On 27th February, 2020, Nigeria reported its first SARS-CoV SARS case. The index case is an Italian national who two days earlier flew into the country from Milan. At the time, only Egypt and Algeria had reported cases of the new coronavirus infection. On Thursday, 5 March 2020, South Africa reported its index case. A 36-year-old male who had traveled to Italy and had returned to South Africa in March in the, on 1st March, 2020. Figure two shows the trend in the confirmed cases using a, a seven day moving average uh, of confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection. 
with South Africa reaching a peak of 12,587 cases on 20th Ju July 2020, and, and Nigeria a peak of 642 confirmed cases on 3rd July 2020. While the quarantine trend in the two cases differ significantly, both countries, like most other African countries, responded very quickly to the initial pronouncement of WHO in January 2020 about the new coronavirus and moved rapidly uh, you know, with, reporting, with the reporting of their index cases. Note that I have, I refer to confirmed cases because we can only talk in terms of the confirmed reported cases than actual prevalent rates or case fatality in a country. Testing rate is important in reported confirmed cases. In the second week of November 20, uh, uh, 2020, the tests per thousand of the population stood at 3.42 in Nigeria. This is against 86.5 tests per thousand of the population in South Africa, 13.44 tests per thousand in Senegal and 44.38 tests per thousand of the population in Rwanda and Senegal. The test rate for Singapore was 695.15 per thousand of the population. Test rates reflect a combination of testing capacity and institutional commitments to confront the pandemic among others. Why much has been made about the unreliability of, the, of case and fatality data from Africa? There is a consensus that the pandemic had, has had hit his, the continent much less than the initial projection suggested. And there has been this scramble again to explain the African dummy. As some of these have been gentle, the early response to the pandemic by several African countries drawing on previous experiences of dealing with epidemics. Uh, the most recently, the most recent one being the Ebola uh, outbreak has been used to explain the less than predicted uh, uh, you know, infection rates and fatality rates. And there is the story of the African youthful population as an explanation. But there have been more bizarre ones. Um, in one case, the high poverty rate and overcrowded shanty towns have been offered to explain the relatively low case and fatality rates. It is a curious one. So what might the policy advice to the UK government be from this proposition. If you want to deal with a raging pandemic, you should let poverty rise precipitously in your country and encourage the growth of slums and shanty towns. In the case of, in the case and fatality impacts, if, if the case and fatality impacts have been much less than predicted, the livelihood effects uh, of partial or total a lockdown will have been more severe. I say will have because we have little in the way of firm and solid data to make a precise determination. In a continent where micro enterprises and informal economy represent a substantial share of the labor market, not being able to trade on a daily basis will impact adversely the livelihood of people who depend on daily receipts. With the adverse impacts of the lockdown in sending countries, migrant remittances are projected to be affected. The World Bank claims that the remittance flows to low and middle income countries are projected to fall by 7% to 508 billion in 2020, followed by a further decline of 7.5% to 470 million billion in 2020-21. The social policy architecture in place before the pandemic matters in the capacity of a country to respond to the livelihood challenges of the contraction of economic activities. Here, the limited available evidence suggests 
that the degree of informality within the economy and the labor market in particular will affect the exposure to the livelihood impact of the public health mitigation measures and the downturn in economic activity. Even if public authorities are inclined to roll out livelihood mitigation measures against the loss of income, the institution may simply not be there to ensure the rich. Much of this, we will argue, has a lot to do with the model of social protection that the dominant international actors have actively pushed and merchandised over the past two decades, the residual segregated social assistance model. The COVID-19 pandemic also shows why inequality matters. The capacity of individuals to cope with the restriction in economic and social activities reflects the inequality of wealth and asset holding and labor market location. It is easy to self-isolate when you live in a mansion. Not so much when you are part of a family of five living in a single room shack. It is easy to ride the short-term loss of income when you have significant discretionary resources stashed away in bank accounts. Less so if you are an informal sector vendor who depends on daily revenue flow for survival. In this regard, South Africa and Nigeria are two of the four African countries with the highest wealth inequality. With South Africa, with, with Gini index of South Africa at 84% and Nigeria at 81.4%, with Nigeria being the only non Southern African countries on that list. Testing capacity, quality of care that medical outfits can provide, capacity to produce testing equipment and reagents, all point to the level and quality of pre pandemic investments in the national system of innovation and the national manufacturing capacity. Even at the much lower levels of the effect of the pandemic on cases and fatalities, the COVID-19 pandemic revealed important deficiencies in these areas of Africa's capacity to respond. These are issues of development. What we mean by development and the nature of the social policy architecture that undergirds a country's welfare regime. The degree of informality in an economy and the labor market has implications for the development of social policy architecture. The proposition here is that the reach of the national social insurance system is constrained by labor market informality. For Africa, this has been reinforced by the intense merchandising of segmented stratified and segregated social policy and the restraint of industrial policy that came as part of the neoliberal public policy project of the last four decades. The deepening of economic informality is itself a product of the reversal of the industrialization project witnessed in the first two decades uh, of Africa's uh, of you know uh, of, of Africa's post-independence period. Figure three suggests that 89.7 percent and 82.7 percent of females and males, respectively, in Africa, are in the informal in informal employment, including agriculture. There are, of course, regional and national variation. Nigeria and South Africa demonstrate such variations. Delano and Adu put the figure of Nigeria's labor force employed in micro enterprises at 81.3% in 2013. The 2020 third quarter labor force survey data from South Africa suggests that in South Africa, 16.72% of the country's labor force is employed in what the National Statistical Agency refers to as the informal sector. This excludes employment in the agricultural sector. Even if we add employment in 
private households, the highest share of informal employment will be 24.35%. Technically, however, informal employment will be less uh, uh, than that these figures uh, suggest, considering that where someone is employed for more than 24 hours per month, domestic employment is subject to, a minim to minimum wage and unemployment insurance provisions in the country. Taken together with the social policy architecture <clears throat> of both countries, the structure of the labor market in Nigeria and South Africa will explain, will explain some of the differences in the social protection responses of Nigeria and South Africa. In Nigeria, a localized lockdown started on the 30, on 30th June, uh, March 2020, affecting uh, Lagos State and Lagos State, Ogo State, and the Federal Capital Territory highlighted <clears throat> on, on, on the slide you know, uh, uh, above. The primary social protection responses included a transfer in cash and the promised food pack for the most vulnerable in the areas affected by the lockdown. The cash transfer involved a lump sum payment of 20,000 Naira to people already on the household uplifting program launched in September 2016. The social assistance program was established as a, as a condition set by the World Bank and Switzerland for Switzerland to return to Nigeria the 322 million US dollars of the Abacha loot lodge in Swiss banks. This loot is part of what the former dictator Sani Abacha was believed to have siphoned from the country's uh, coffers. As of March 2020, the National Social Register from which the HUP beneficiaries are drawn had on its roll 2.6 million households, about 11 million Nigerians. To get a sense of the generosity of the amount paid as cash transfer to mitigate the livelihood impact of the lockdown, the lump sum payment is equivalent to 333 Naira per day. A 500 gram loaf of white bread in Lagos cost 355 Naira at its start of the lockdown. Food parcels were distributed sporadically in some states, but the widespread looting of government warehouses as an adjunct to the hashtag NSAS protest movement in October 2020 is indicative of the sense of fairness and efficiency in the distribution of the parks. The hashtag NSAS protest was initially a revolt led by young people uh, you know, against uh, incidents of police brutality. At the end of October 2020, another one-off cash payment of 30,000 Naira was announced. This was targeted at artisans and self-employed individuals. The scheme restricts the payout to 9,000 beneficiaries in each of the 36 states of the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory. In South Africa, a national lockdown came into effect on 26 March, 2020. The social protection measures to mitigate the livelihood impact involved three broad instruments. First involves existing social grants, uh, Child support grants was raised for, uh, to 740 rand per child in May uh, from June to October. The grant reverts to 444 uh, uh, naira per rand per child, while caregivers of a child receive 500 uh, rand a month for the period of June to October 2020. This amount is regardless of the number of children in the household who received the grant. Um, recipients of, the, of all other grants receive a top up of 250 rand 
per month from June to October 2020. These grants cover 17 million beneficiaries out of which about 12.5 million were child support grant beneficiaries. In addition to the top up of the social grants, a new special COVID special relief distress grant was introduced for those who are nom normally not recipients of any of the existing grants. Uh, and this came to, I uh, was pegged at 350 rand per month. Uh, initially expected to run until October 2020, this special grant now has been extended to January 2021. A third instrument concerned with protecting jobs is the temporary employee employer relief scheme. The scheme was implemented under the National Unemployment Insurance Fund, a contributory social insurance scheme that covers income loss while unemployed, uh, while unemployed for a limited period. It is the national social insurance housed at the National Department of Employment and Labor. Uh, in March 2019, the net asset of the UIF was 144.26 billion. The tax compensate employers who are unable to pay full salaries of the employees and employees who are for long could uh, apply to the scheme. Claims under the scheme is capped at 17,000 rand 712 per month per employee. As of October, 27th October 2020, over 51 billion had been paid to 1 million companies, uh, you know, uh, disbursed in, in over 11.5 million payments. It is difficult to imagine that the UIF could have played the role it did in protecting jobs and livelihood if it had been designed around market-based insurance model. Its strength and relevance lies in being a publicly managed national social insurance scheme. The structure of the South African labor markets and the space of social insurance for the 70% of those in the labor market allows the institutional basis and the national social insurance to support livelihood at a much higher level than what is offered to those supported through social assistance measures. Let me shift attention to the R&I and manufacturing deficit that the, uh, you know, the, the pandemic revealed. In March, 2020, news emerged that researchers at the Institute Pasteur de Dakar in Senegal had developed a rapid diagnostic kit that will cost about $1 and produce results in a matter of minutes, not hours. Senegal and the Institute have accumulated considerable experiences dealing with the epidemic in the past, the latest being the uh, Ebola uh, epidemic. Like many other African countries, Experience of dealing with the early case, earlier cases of uh, epidemic came into play in the mitigation and control of the COVID-19 pandemic. The diagnostic kit is developed and being validated in partnership with a number of organizations, including the UK's Bedfordshire-based Monologic. While most news outlets, outlets and the researchers at the Institute Pasteur claim the development of the kit as largely their innovation. More logic claims on its website that it, that, and I quote, that it is working in close partnership with the Institute Pasteur to Dakar to validate and manufacture the COVID-19 test at a new manufacturing site, Diatropics, which is an outfit of Institute de Pasteur in Senegal. This will be the first time the, the diagnostic kit created in the UK will be jointly manufactured in Africa to ensure its immediate availability. Now, while international collaboration is important for scientific endeavors, in the Institute Pasteur's tie with MoLogic betrays once again the crisis of dependence and intellectual and scientific 
sovereignty, in which Senegalese researchers are likely to be reduced to junior partners. Much of this has to do with the investment in and the building of the national research and innovation capacity within the framework of a national sovereign project. The underfunding of the innovation infrastructure turned into defunding in the wake of the first wave neoliberalism, a la structural adjustment programs in Africa. The validation of the diagnostic kit, test kit is being undertaken in the UK, not Senegal. The issue is not if African scientists are capable of innovation. That's not a doubt. The, cons the, the concern is the, the defunding of the broader infrastructure that the national system of innovation requires for an autonomous and sovereign functioning. Similarly, scientists at the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research in Lagos developed the SARS-CoV-2 isothermal molecular assay CIMA kit that is 10 times less expensive than the standard PRC test and will produce results in under 40 minutes. The reagents used in the CIMA test kits still needed to be imported from the UK. The validation of the test kits will still depend on research establishments in Europe. Nigeria imports much of its test kits and personal protective equipment from China. South Africa with more depth of manufacturing capacity and support for national system of innovation was for much of the first eight months of the pandemic importing diagnostic test kits. In July, 2020, the Minister of Higher Education and Innovation made seven awards totaling 18 million rand to seven local companies. And I quote, in order to ramp up the country's ability to produce locally developed reagents and test give kits for COVID-19, end of quote. The companies had six months to begin production. In other words, we're looking at something uh, like February, March next year. Early in the pandemic, uh, the African Union uh, established the Africa Medical Supplies Platform uh, to coordinate the acquisition of medical supplies. The facility helps member states to acquire medical resources at bulk price. The PRC test kits being offered on the platform are imports from India, the US, uh, with vendors uh, in, in Lyon, France, uh, and so on. The glaring absence of autonomous manufacturing capacity and dependence is evident. The above is indicative of deficiencies in manufacturing capacity, national system of innovation, and the associated ecosystem necessary for immediate response to external shocks such, such as the pandemic. Perhaps nothing signifies the crisis of investment uh, in national system of innovation as much as the vaccine story. As far as I can tell, there is no correct candidate vaccine emerging out of our continent. Of the 48 candidate vaccines in different clinical stages, at clinical trial stages, over 12 are from companies and research outfits based in China, four in India, three in South Korea, if you count the International Vaccine Institute, two in Australia, and one in Singapore, Taiwan, Cuba, Japan, uh, Kazakhstan each. The rest are research entities based in Europe and North America. Again, the COVID-19 pandemic highlights the crisis of maldevelopment and what Mkandawiri referred to as the maladjustment of Africa. The maladjustment is not simply of the, its economies, but its society, its labor market, and its systems of innovation. The consequences of this are apparent in what Jayati Ghosh refers to as vaccine ap uh, you know, apartheid. Within days of Pfizer, BioNTech announcing the first successful vaccine development, 
we already seen vaccine holding. As you know, uh, the article notes, within days of its announcement, Pfizer had sold more than 80% of the vaccine doses it will be able to produce by the end of next year's to governments representing only 14% of the global population. The same vaccine holding is equally playing out with the candidate vaccines from Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca. Even if Africa and other developing countries gain access to vaccines through the COVID-19 vaccine global access facility, COVAX, it will be from the position of weakness and relative dependence. The point about the lessons that we can draw from Africa's experience of the COVID-19 pandemic is that development matters. So does transformative social policy. And I will turn to this in, in this last segment of, of this lecture. Over a decade ago, at the inaugural lecture that he delivered at the London School of Economics, Tandikam Kandawire made a distinction between the Truman and the Bandung Conference versions of the post-World War II development discourse. The Truman take on development in which international development is mired, development is the moral premise of helping distant strangers with his attendant paternalism. The dominant version of thinking in international development, uh, you know, uh, in the wake of what John Toye has, as in the wake of what John Toye refers to as the counter revolution in development, denuded development of strategic planning and industrial policy. In its place, development has become more concerned with microeconomic processes of human development and the relief of poverty. In the pursuit of this diminution of what development means, vast areas of African continent has been turned into spaces of open laboratory experiments with the methodology of randomized control that says a lot about little. Giving money to the poor was declared a silent or quiet revolution in development. Barbara Harris White has aptly described the new poverty agenda uh, within in the, and development, re, re, thinking of development as the impoverishment of the concept of development. At the April 20, 2010 lecture, Tandika offered a vision of development grounded in the Bandung spirit. Development involves growth with structural transformation of economy and society, the mastery of technology and strong manufacturing capacity. Catching up a phrase Tandika had no problem using requires in quotes that countries know themselves and their history that has set the initial conditions for any further progress, end of quote. Development requires learning from the pioneers, but it is not mimicry. The knowledge imperative requires considerable investment in institution of knowledge production and state capacity, the capacity to coordinate and steer the development process. This involves a sustained ecosystem of innovation and capacity to respond to a broad range of challenges. Structural transformation and the mastery of technology go with strong and innovative manufacturing capacity. In the Bandung spirit, development in the words of Samir Amin is also grounded in a national sovereign project 
It is a quest for averting the extraversion of economy, culture, and the knowledge system that is inherent in the nature of imperialism. What we learn from the COVID-19 pandemic is the urgency of Africa's quest for development in the sense that Tandika understood it and, under, under, and, and that underpins the Africa Union's agenda 2063. Africa's development path cannot be subject to the discursive constraints from the West, but neither can it rely on the earth depleting models of the West's history of structural transformation. When the president of the European Association of Development Research and, Tra and Training Institute in a recent blog calls for, I quote, overcoming developmentalism, end of quote. And the article is accompanied by the image of a smoldering urban refuse dump, which I believe is supposed to represent, uh, uh, you know, part of Af Africa and part of Asia. It is important to retort that what the image signifies is not an uncompromising commitment to development. What it signifies is maldevelopment. A second component of Tandika's thinking on development is that African countries not only have to be developmental, but they also have to be democratic and inclusive. Development, developmental in the sense of managing the economies, I quote from a 2007 uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 lecture that Tandika gave in uh, uh, Buenos Aires, uh, I quote, in a manner that maximizes economic growth, and I can return to this in Q&A, induces structural change, uses all available resources in a responsible and sustainable manner in, hi in highly competitive global conditions, end of quote. Democratic in the sense of being embedded in deliberative governance and the respect for people's rights. Socially inclusive in providing all citizens with a decent living. At the heart of both <clears throat> enabling socioeconomic development and ensuring equity is the idea of transformative social policy. It is a conceptual and evaluative take on social policy that emerged out of the multinational social policy and development research program that Tandika led at the, as the director of uh, UNRIST in Geneva. <clears throat> at the heart of the framework is a question that Tandika posed at the onset of the research program. What questions will a country ask of its social policy in the context of development? Transformative social policy emphasizes the complementarity of economic and social policy, highlights the multiple tasks of social policy, and insists on the deployment of social policy in ensuring equity and inclusivity in the development process. Tandika identified four tasks of social policy, production, protection, reproduction, and redistribution. I have argued for a fifth task of social policy, that of social cohesion or nation building. It is not that Tandika was unaware of the importance of social cohesion. It is that it did not feature in the primary task that he attributed to social, social policy. Further, the social policy for inclusive development has to be underpinned by the norms of solidarity and the pursuit of equality and equity. Transformative social policy is concerned with the transformation of the economy, social relation, and social institutions. It is concerned with mitigating this disruptive impact of the development process itself. Central to the transformation of social relations is the transformation of gender relations. What has been, the, been evident 
in the social assistance responses of the segregated residual social assistance to COVID-19 that we discussed earlier, it has, is that it is grossly inadequate in mitigating the livelihood impacts of the pandemic. A loaf of bread may mean you don't die of hunger, but it does less, nothing else. Social assistance package that is sufficient to buy a loaf of bread may keep hunger at bay, but it does little else. Yet, the social relief of distress grant has become a cause celebre within the basic income civil society campaign in South Africa. A wider vision of human being requires a broader instrument. And what the slide shows is the diversity of the instruments uh, available, policy instruments available that will be mobilized around the various tasks of social policy, uh, both in the, in the context of development with explicit development outcomes. Building social cohesion and a more equal society is important for how society copes with external shocks. Social cohesion that builds trust between states and society and within society allows for a more cohesive response to a pandemic. One that does not turn the non-wearing of a mask in a pandemic into a political statement of defiance. Social cohesion nurtures the norms of other regarding in which not catching the virus is as important as not passing it on. And I end on this note. At the heart of the imperative of development underpinned by transformative social policy is Mwalimu Yerere's pivotal idea of the defense and respect for human dignity. I thank you. Jimmy, that was uh, absolutely fabulous. And Tandika Makande, we would be smiling on you right now. Let me turn the floor over now to Dr. Kate Mahar for a, um, a, a, a set of comments. Thank you, Kate. Uh, stop sharing my screen. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Jimmy, for a lot of food for thought. Um, it's it's wonderful to have you here and to have voices carrying on the concept and the the thinking embedded in uh, Tandika's transformative social policy perspective, and to see it connected into this idea of coronavirus and start to think through what transformative social policy can tell us about coronavirus. So I have a few issues I want to raise and I'll ask questions as I go along. Um, the first one is just to think about what we're talking about when we're talking about um, transformative social policy when you brought it up at, at the end. This idea that social policy is often seen in development thinking as really a, a palliative measure to kind of top up those who haven't started to benefit yet or who are somehow exclu excluded from some of the core development processes. But transformative social policy actually pushes the idea of social policy farther and says social policy can be a central part of the development process as you were discussing. Uh, and this draws very much on the Nordic approach to uh, to late development in which they saw social policy, universal social policy, unemployment insurance, old age pensions, um, uh, various child benefits, et cetera, as a way of creating a huge investable pool of resources that not only help to support the population and create uh, uh, reinforce state legitimacy, but also created resources under the control of the state that could be invested in 
infrastructure, industrialization, et cetera. So this connects with some of the issues I see that you're, you're raising here. First about the informal economy. So for example, you point out that the informal economy uh, is very large in Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest share of informality of any region in the world, about 87% of the labor force of, informal empl of employment is informal employment in Africa. So the informal economy, as you mentioned, is often seen as limiting the reach of social protection systems. They can reach the formally employed, they can't reach the informally employed. But recently there's been a real shift in thinking in which now the informal economy and even more so under uh, the coronavirus uh, situation, the informal economy is seen as the key target of social protection, particularly in the context of uh, cash transfers. So I'm wondering if you could comment a bit more on why that is the case. Why is the informal economy now being viewed as the key target of social protection rather than something that limited social protection? Is it about new technology for transferring resources to informal actors, maybe through mobile money? Is it about new kinds of statistics, new statistical um, uh, measures and uh, protocols that now reach and count the informal economy? For example, in the ILOs, uh, men and women in the informal economy, their statistical um, volume on uh, measures of the informal economy across the world. Um, and with regard to the statistics, I'm wondering if uh, you can comment at all on the gap between the statistics that make the informal economy visible to the ILO or to uh, ID students so that they can say that the informal economy in South Africa is smaller than the informal economy in Nigeria and put numbers to it. But to what extent do these statistical innovations extend to social registers, to the kind of social statistics that allow, for example, the state to reach the people in the informal economy who are perhaps being uh, harmed by coronavirus? There's been some very interesting research coming out of Peru that pointed out that the state created these new cash transfers to the poor under coronavirus, but then realized that they didn't have the mechanisms actually to reach out to these new poor. They had no idea where they were, they weren't counted. Um, so the informal economy was visible to a sort of global, how big is it kind of perspective, but totally invisible to the social registers of the state for reaching out to the informal economy. And there, I'm wondering if you could connect that idea of whether the state, the relevant parts of the state that can provide, can, can carry out welfare provision, um, are able to reach the informal economy. Uh, some of the wider issues raised by Tandika about the differential capacity of states within Africa based on Samira means um, uh, typologies of African states built colonialism, um, that settler economies have very strong social welfare and population control capacities, bureaucratic capacities for um, statistics and social welfare um, uh, measures. Uh, but cash crop economies like Nigeria uh, have very weak capacities for reaching out to populations. So would this mean that in a new era emphasizing, say, universal basic income or social transfers, that certain African countries are going to be much better at reaching their informal populations suffering from coronavirus lockdowns and other types of livelihood interruptions than other types of African economies? And what might be the implications of that? Um, I also wanted to raise a third question about universal basic income, which you point out is the new cause célèbre, not only of the World Bank, but of civil society uh, actors of WeGo, the informal economy focused NGO, of SEWA, of so many large um, progressive organizations that are really looking out for the interests of the people. And I always feel that when the World Bank and progressive organizations that are concerned about the welfare of the people on the ground come together to propose the same policy, there's something worrying going on there and we need to take a closer look. 
Um, certainly the universal basic income that you described is a bare minimum top up. And I'm wondering if there are debates in South Africa, possibly in Nigeria as well, but you'd probably be at this stage more familiar with uh, South Africa about what a basic income should look like if it is to be brought in as a way of trying to protect informal actors. Um, the second thing would be if this amount of money is both targeted at the poor and so small, would it have any value as a pool of investable resources from which uh, investments could be made in, say, producing one's own test kits or producing one's own masks in order to respond to uh, manufacturing opportunities within a country? Or does it just draw resources out of being able to invest in transforming the economy? Does it just eat up resources? Um, and how are these forms of uh, social policy funded? How are these cash transfers, this universal basic income, how is it seen to be funded? Is it being funded by taxing some of the larger corporations that perhaps are, are benefiting from the pandemic that are do, uh, continue to earn uh, large quantities of profits? Or is it focused on expanding the tax net to a wider range of the local population who are already struggling to, to get by? It would be interesting to know a bit more about how this debate about the basic income uh, sees uh, the, the way in which this income ought to be raised. Um, it's interesting also to note that in Korea, uh, one of the countries that has been very effective in uh, responding to the pandemic, one of the early things they did is say, wow, our supply chain, we're, we're locked down, our supply chains are interrupted, China is locked down, this is interrupting our supply chains, we're going to start manufacturing masks. And so they, they immediately went into the manufacturing export of masks and retooled their economy in a way that allowed them economically to deal with the pandemic well. Okay, a final issue I want to raise, and I'm sure my time is nearly up, uh, relates to the way that, um, that social protection has affected Africa, and uh, sorry, that coronavirus has affected Africa in particular. Um, you mentioned 47,000 uh, deaths. So 47,000 deaths in a continent of 1.2 billion people, that's fewer deaths than the UK. And you do point out that there are issues of testing, et cetera, but there has been quite a lot of work on excess deaths. And as you pointed out, many people accept that in fact, far fewer people are dying of coronavirus in Africa than in most other parts of the world. So with this low level of deaths, we have a situation in which coronavirus actually hasn't been a huge health threat to people in Africa. Um, about 400,000 people a year die of TB and malaria in Africa, but about 47,000, mind you, over six months, so we, with the full statistics are yet to come in. But it certainly hasn't been the kind of killer that a number of other diseases in Africa have been and continue to be. Um, so, Lined up alongside with this, today there is a meeting of the WTO to address the need to try to, to encourage uh, countries and companies to waive their intellectual property rights over vaccines to allow them to be manufactured by anybody so that you can have um, basically generic vaccine manufacture anywhere in the world. If South Africa knows how to manufacture a particular vaccine, they can just do it and give it out to its own people. Um, but there is huge resistance to waiving intellectual property rights to company, which would make companies lose profits and also would uh, mean that the control of manufacturing of the vaccines would be decentralized out of the control of the countries that are making them. Um, so I'm wondering uh, in, in that regard, where where do you see this putting African countries? They would not be in a position to produce their own vaccines because they haven't got a vaccine of their own. They couldn't manufacture them generically unless it's agreed that um, uh, AstraZeneca and co agree that 
uh, they will waive their property rights, which they seem extremely unwilling to do. Um, and they are in a position where they're under pressure really to engage with the vaccination of large populations at a significant cost and make coronavirus vaccination one of their core uh, prior priorities for health expenditure. Um, but you talked at the same time about the importance of more deliberative um, social policy making in Africa. So the idea that African countries are urged to make a vaccine, um, vaccinating their population a health resource priority and health priority when it is actually not the most significant health problem on the, contact, on the continent, that universal basic income is being encouraged. Um, you've done quite a lot of work on cash transfers, and I'm wondering if you could say something about the extent to which these cash transfer universal basic income policies are actually the product of an African um, social policy priority, or if there's a certain pressure to adopt a vision of a certain approach to social policy that is not necessarily commensurate with the objectives of given African countries. I think that uh, that's an area that you've done a lot of work on. So it would be interesting to hear your comments on the policy process of things like cash transfers, universal basic income, uh, the manufacture of vaccines, or even whether there are discussions about whether coronavirus should be a health priority once uh, things kind of uh, smooth out uh, over time uh, as the, the, the coronavirus situation kind of calms down in the rest of the world. Um, does, it, does it make sense in the African context? It's, is it something that is being prioritized in the African context, context that resources should be spent on um, uh, coronavirus as a priority relative to other uh, health uh, um, issues in the African context. Thank you very much and I'll stop there. All right, thank you. Hey, thank you very much. As usual, very insightful uh, uh, set of comments and questions. And so before we, we end our live broadcast, Jimmy, I wonder if you want to take up just briefly one or two of the penetrating questions of Kate, um, while also our student um, and LSE audience, please write your questions into the chat, which we'll come on to after we end the live broadcast. So Jimmy, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Kate, um, especially for your opening, uh, you know, remarks, because it allowed, I, I was, you know, usually with this, you know, time is, is the enemy and, you mm -hmm. know, the, and when you're given one hour, you make effort to go below one hour, not over one hour, you know, and, um, and, and I think you, you know, um, eloquently, you know, uh, supplemented, you know, uh, some of the, issues that I would normally would raise if this were to be a regular, uh, you know, uh, to convert this into a regular paper and so on and so forth. Um, look, what, you know, I, I, I think the issue of, of cash transfer and the informality thing uh, has to be taken within the context of a, a substantive remaking of the state's within the neoliberal project. I, I know that it, it, it's, it's often taken as um, a throwaway concept that, that is increasingly devoid of, of, of meaning. Um, <clears throat> but when you take um, a, an example of Nigeria uh, in the 1970s, where public health you know, was, was universally available um, and 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 generally free at no point of uh, what at, at at the point of of use, um, regardless of whether you're dealing with primary health care or tertiary uh, curative uh, care something and you know, and then you have a, a shift over time to the current situation in which the country is much richer than what it was in the 1970s, uh, but but increasingly, you know, what do you call it? Uh, the, if, if the if the 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 healthcare is not privatized, uh, it's 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 you know what do you call it? Uh, is the underinvestment in the public health you know facilities? Uh, 
I, I, I like to, you know, what do you call it, use this phrase about uh, how the, 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 the neoliberal face altered the way the state thinks about the citizens. Um, um, it, 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 in a situation where the citizens have, have become what is essentially a fiscal liability rather than an asset. And, and if, you, if you look at what, what has then happened within that framework of, of, of a market-centric logic driving everything, uh, the, the whole idea of the discovery of the, of, of, uh, the informal sector, and, and you're familiar with this, you've done you know, a lot of work on this, it, it's within the framework of what is called the bottom of the pyramid, pyramid business model. Uh, in other words, that there's money to be made providing services to the poor. Now, if you look at what is then being offered, uh, let, let's take the, the, what do you call it, uh, um, um, uh, micro pension schemes, for instance. Uh, uh, you, you, know, you, you know, what do you call it, uh, a concept document by a consultancy firm in Lagos was talking about, oh, you can get people to contribute 100 Naira. Uh, the exchange rate is around 360, 386 Naira to the US dollar. You know, you can get them to contribute 100 Naira over time. And then they did, they did the calculation about how much money they will accumulate and this and that. Um, and, and then you ask yourself, what is the actuarial process involved in terms of the adequacy of these resources to sustain income in old age? That is the future. In other words, essentially, it's about milking the poor uh, for profit. Uh, when you look at at the, the 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 privatization of the healthcare, sorry, of the pension scheme in in, in the Nigerian context, for instance, uh, as part of the reform, you know, uh, to move into from uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, un, unfunded PSG go system to uh, individual uh, what do you call it, uh, 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 retirement accounts uh, and this and that. Uh, an early study that I remember, you know, what do you call it, uh, came out of University of Lagos. Uh, show that actually it's about almost 42 percent goes into administrative costs and it's it, 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 it declines significantly then you know but when you look at the number of companies that are emerging out of all this um there is no evidence that this actually provides the kind of support that you deal with and then the same thing comes in within the cash transfer system the point is not with cash transfer it's in the residual segregated nature in which we understand cash transfer. If you take, you know, uh, 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 you know, the, you know, the, the notion that, you know, what do you call it? This is exclusively for the poor. And then you said, but what does poverty mean? Uh, and 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 the poor, the poverty is no longer about about the poor. It's about the ultra poor. And, and then when you say, okay, well, how many of the ultra poor are you get? Well, even if you look at the Kalomo something, for instance, less than. The La Calomo project that started started all this, uh, what do you call it, uh, in, in, in Zambia, uh, less than a third of people who are identified in the selected area as food poor were covered. And then, as part of the experiment, you have to ensure that there is no leakage. In other words, when you give money to one person in a village in which virtually everybody would normally have qualified, you require them not to share the money with other people in the village. And, and, I, and I've asked, you know, what kind of bizarre experiments do people go about doing when you undermine the social, what do you call it, the, the glue that actually hosts communities together in communities where people survive, where resilience is not individual, it's a collective thing, where people survive by sharing. Uh, so, so, uh, and 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 my my concern with you know a basic income grant is not with basic income grant itself. So there are a lot of people who consider it a very progressive thing. Well, Milton Friedman, you know, was an advocate of basic income grant. Uh, 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 what do you call it? Um, uh, 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 Frederick Hayek was a supporter of uh, you know what an advocate of basic income grant. We know that when we're dealing with the question of poverty, it is not the money you give out to people, it is the level of generosity 
of 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 what is given that that actually guarantees that you 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 avoid poverty. and I and I've used this thing. If you were to take the what do you call it uh, those uh, lecture I gave uh, several years ago, where the 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 bread uh, what do you call it. Uh, indicative uh, something of generosity was forced to use. Uh, that when you look at, uh, what do you call it, uh, the MDG1, uh, which set the poverty threshold at $1.25 at the time. Um, if And I remember in the town, small town where I was living in South Africa at the time, at $1.26, $1.26, um, you buy a loaf of bread and a bottle of water. And I remember quipping that, uh, where you know they will not die of hunger, but poverty will reduce by the end of September because most of the poor will have died, formerly poor will have died of hypothermia because that money means there's no clothing, there are no shoes, and there are no housing, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think you're right about the issue about the challenges that confront uh, Africa in terms of healthcare, something and this or that. Um, the, the pandemic is a global thing uh, and it's a serious thing to be considered. Uh, but I suspect it's grabbing all attention because it's hitting, uh, what do you call it, uh, the, the, the rich countries much more than any other uh, something. It is not that Africa does not need to respond to it. Africa needs to respond to it. But it's the infrastructure, it's the social policy architecture that you build that helps you to address malaria, which you also need to help you as address the pandemic. And my focus here is that in the review, and I'll, I'll stop in a minute, in the, in the, in the, 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 the what do you call it? it? If you look at the lesson, what it exposes is the deficiencies, uh, you know, in, in manufacturing capacity. You talk about uh, 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 South Korea being able to respond uh, in terms of uh, what do you call it, uh, you know, uh, production of uh, masks and so on and so on. But that's based on a pre-existing manufacturing capacity and systems of innovation. And 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 I, and I think you know when when we get to a situation where development is defined as the relief of poverty, uh, then we need to ask the question: What exactly? is the point. And, and this is where it's important to emphasize again, Tandika's you know, word, reinforcement of the imperative of a return to the Bandung spirit in the understanding of development. You mean, I think that's a beautiful note to, to end our public broadcast. And I'm asking our students to please type their questions into the chat line. And I wanna thank everybody who came to listen on YouTube, remind you that um, next week, Nora Lustig will be speaking to us from New Orleans. She's professor of Latin American economics there, and she'll be speaking about inequality in markets, COVID and COVID-19 and policies. So I invite you all to join us again next Friday afternoon at the same time. Um,